Okay. So welcome everyone um, to the, hi, I'm not sure what number it is. It'll be the fifth um, seminar in the, the geography uh, seminar series in Trinity College Dublin. And we're very happy to have with us Louise Fitzgerald uh, from Maynooth University, um, who is assistant professor in geography there, uh, recently joined. I believe she's settling into her uh, office there today. <laughs> um, and Louise and I have only met, she actually was in Trinity formerly working with uh, Anna Davis, um, but we didn't really have the chance to meet at that point because it was kind of high peak, peak COVID -y times. Um, so she existed as a, as a name on a list, <laughs> email. But I was really happy to meet Louise this year, and, and it's been great. And I think we've a lot of uh, she and I have a lot of uh, intellectual uh, shared interests and political concerns. Um, and I've also seen her give fantastic presentations on other parts of this project. So really looking forward to this today. So Louise will talk for about 35, 40 minutes, and then we will open it up for questions. And I think that there's not like loads of us. So I think probably at that point, um, if you want to kind of ask your, your question, in person, that would be nice if you're able to. If you're not because of noise in the background or whatever, um, you can uh, pop it into the chat and I, I'll pass it on to Louise. But um, so if we come to the questions, if you want to kind of identify yourself by sticking a hand up um, um, or just, you know, butting into the conversation. There's, I think there's sufficiently a number we can make it nice and informal. OK, Louise, so I'll, I'll hand it over to you and uh, um, you can take it away. I'll mute OK, myself. great. Thanks so much. Ray. I'm just going to share my screen so you can also see. Um, okay, hope you can see that all fine. So, um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Louise Fitzgerald, as Rory introduced me, and I'm an assistant professor at um, Maynooth University. So, my research broadly deals with um, issues of justice in environmental topics and how to develop more inclusive um, sustainability transitions and kind of looking at the uneven impacts of. Um, environmental policy approaches and environmental governance approaches. Um, so yeah, before I begin, uh, I just wanna um, start with some thank yous and acknowledgements. So I'd first, of course, like to thank uh, Rory for inviting me and organizing the seminar. Um, I'd like to thank Kathleen Stokes, who I know had a big role in, play, in uh, putting the seminar together uh, when it initially got started. Um, Anna Davis was mentioned there by Rory, and I'd like to also thank uh, Anna, because Anna um, helped me in a kind of earlier iteration of this project when I was looking for funding. And um, I'd also like to thank Minute uh, Geography Department, who supported this research through the Research Incentivization Award. Um, and finally, I'd like to just thank and acknowledge the communities in Leitrim, who um, first highlighted um, to me the issues that were going on with forestry in the county and um, as I'll talk later on um, in the presentation, I think we have a, a lot to learn from them um, in terms of um, the impacts of how we're approaching sustainability transitions and how we might do it in more um, just and inclusive ways. So um, I just want to start uh, by, by giving you an overview of, oh, sorry. Uh, here we go. So this is um, ongoing work, so it's work in progress. So please do uh, receive it in that way. And I'm very glad to take any questions if something isn't clear, because it's quite a complex topic that I'm myself still getting to grips with. Um, but I, um, firstly, basically what I'm gonna do today is give you an introduction to, to the issue of forestry through a review of scholarly and activist research, which has been going on around um, the impacts of forestry plantations globally. Um, I'll also give an introduction to Leitrim and some of the kind of key defining elements of, um, of how forestry is, is, is going on there. Um, then I'll discuss the approach that I've taken in this research, which is using a feminist political ecology approach, and I'll explain what that means for those of you perhaps not familiar with it, and also just share some details about the fieldwork I've been doing in County Leitrim. Um, I'll then share the findings, like I said, which are uh, kind of tentative or preliminary or because um, it's an ongoing research project as to the impacts of forestry currently for rural communities, um, which can be seen uh, in the county of Leitrim. I'll then share some analysis and discussion of the impacts of forestry plantation through the lens of feminist political ecology and other work on justice in sustainability transitions. Um, and then finally, just share some uh, concluding remarks. So, um, so just to begin then with an introduction and review um, to the kind of forestry topic to help sort of set this in context. 
So um, at an international and national level uh, for many decades now, we've seen the promotion of forestry and planta forestry plantations um, in the context of uh, climate and biodiversity crises. So for example, um, the, the RED uh, program or the RED Plus program was launched by the UN in 2008 to reduce deforestation. Um, so to um, reduce deforestation of existing uh, projects. And um, also there's been an emphasis on planting new projects in order to offset or sink um, emissions that are in the atmosphere or ongoing carbon emissions. Um, so uh, kind of parallel to these developments, um, both uh, scholarly research and uh, activist research has highlighted the impacts of these kind of abstract uh, top-down international approaches and discourses for communities on the ground where these forestry plantations um, and projects are being implemented. So Leach and Schoons, for example, talk about carbon conflicts, particularly looking at countries in um, Africa, uh, talking about the, the sort of the contestations uh, around discourses, around politics, around um, different values, um, and, and, and also the kind of dispossession of, of local peoples um, that are resulting from these uh, forestry plantations. Um, there's also um, been a lot of activist research around contestations over red in particular. So um, thing, uh, the document I've shared here is um, the No Red Reader, which as you can see was written by the Red Monitor Global Justice uh, Ecology Project, uh, Carbon Trade Watch and the Indigenous Environmental Network. And really uh, it's a series of essays or reports as to the impacts um, particularly on uh, local communities, on indigenous peoples of the, this promotion of forestry plantations as a way to deal with the, um, uh, to deal with the climate crisis, really highlighting again the, the, the exclusion of local communities um, and, and the kind of dispossessions that are going on. So, um, other scholarly analysis, such as uh, by Fairhead Leach and Schoons, um, have analysed uh, forestry plantations, these developments, um, in the kind of wider context of green grabbing. So some of you might be familiar with the concept of land grabbing, but essentially green grabbing is the process by which um, land and other resources are um, taken off people, uh, justified by green aims. So in the case of forestry, you know, to... Um, to protect forests or to uh, plant new new forests. Um, in recent years, there's been kind of growing understanding and scholarly appreciation of um, the risks of processes of decarbonization, which might be well intentioned, um, as as leading to to dispossession. So as um, um, deepening uh, inequality and injustices. So the work has been done by Brock, by uh, Sovacool and Dunlop um, in particular, highlighting across different cases, um, both in the global south and also Brock looking at the case of the German energy transition and, and who was kind of left behind and who were the victims of these uh, decarbonization processes uh, on the ground. So um, despite um, work by organizations such as FERN or um, some recent looking into the EU bioeconomy in Sweden and Finland and the kind of politics of knowledge and the impacts of that, um, there's still quite a gap in policy and research knowledges of the forest impacts of communities elsewhere. So the scholarly research that I, anal uh, that I talked about um, in this slide it's broadly looking at communities in the global south, but there's been little, if perhaps no, um, research done as to what are the impacts of the drive for forestry plantations um, for communities in the global north. So it's kind of in this uh, gap that my research sits as a kind of initial attempt to sketch out the impacts uh, for local communities. So um, turning now to talk about the place that I, I looked at, because um, maybe some of you aren't familiar with it. So uh, in order to start addressing this gap, I looked at um, County Leitrim. Um, sorry, this is an issue with how it's displaying for me, so I can't see my slides. Okay, um, so just to share a little bit about County Leitrim in case those of you aren't familiar with it. So here you can see it on the map. Um, so County Leitrim, um, it's quite sparsely populated. So I think it's the maybe the lowest uh, population density in the country. So it's 35,000 people, which has actually risen uh, since the last census. Um, because people are moving there because the, the property and land is more affordable. Um, it's also, as you can see in this image, it's on the border. And um, that's an important um, thing, I think, to bear in mind as I talk through uh, the impacts of forestry on communities in Leitrim. 
uh, both in terms of the essentially the, the socio-economic impacts um, of you know both legacies of, of conflict and of colonialization, but also um, uh, in terms of the the kind of knowledges that are are prioritized and valued, uh, and kind of different ways of, of seeing, as I'll talk about um, as I go through the slides. Um, so then to give you some um, shape as to the forestry that's going on in, in Leitrim, um, so broadly it's a non-native Sika spruce uh, industrial monoculture plantation, so that's quite a lot of words, but just to unpack some of that, so uh, Sika spruce is a conifer, which is uh, not native to Ireland, it's native as, uh, to North America, I think it is, so kind of colder climates. Um, it's uh, industrial monoculture, so it's monoculture in the sense that broadly it's it's just one species that's planted, so thick spruce uh, plantations, and it's industrial or commercial in the sense that it's planted for a crop of timber, so it's not planted to be uh, left there indefinitely, but it's it's harvested on 30, 40, 50 year cycles and then replanted. Um, there's a difference between North and South Leitrim when it comes to forestry, and uh, North Leitrim, as you can see, is quite upland. Uh, the forestry that's going on in North Leitrim would have been uh, historical um, starting maybe in the in the 60s, um, where it was more state led forestry, whereas South Leitrim was experiencing more um, uh, private forestry. Um, and I'll explain that as, as it goes on. And just to give you a sense of how it's moving. So the 2022 forestry statistics counted about 20 percent of um, land cover is under forestry in, in Leitrim at the moment. So quite a considerable amount um, and definitely disproportionate uh, when you look at the forestry cover um, across Ireland. And also this is up from the last forestry inventory um, from 2017, which placed it at 18.9%. So it's like uh, there's an increasing amount of land under forestry in Leitrim. Um, and just in terms of the kind of breakdown of who's um, Owning the forester who's um, who's participating in forestry, uh, at least the afforestation statistics of 2021 said that there was one farmer plantation of 2.27 uh, uh, hectares and uh, 17 non-farmer plant plantations. Um, and work by Sian Komen in particular um, with Save Leitrim, a group who's uh, campaigning on forestry, has highlighted that actually it's a, a large percentage of, of private companies that are now getting into forestry. Um, and are owning forestry in Leitrim. So not um, people who aren't resident in Leitrim, but aren't even necessarily resident in Ireland. So what's come back to me in the research is the role of kind of pen international pension funds and um, other companies who are, who are buying forestry in Leitrim uh, because you basically can draw down grants both for planting and also for 15 years. So it's kind of seen as a, a secure investment. And this is driving also a lot of, a lot of forestry going on at the moment in Leitrim. So I'd just like now to turn to explaining uh, the approach that I used and some kind of key things um, for those of you who perhaps aren't familiar with feminist political ecology uh, and to just share what it can contribute in terms of our understanding of forestry and the impacts. So political ecology, um, it basically combines ecology, so think about ecological issues with political economy to address relations between society and environmental resources and between social groups and the classes with differing access to those resources. So essentially, uh, similar to political ecology, looking at issues of power, vested interest, inequality, and um, in the case of ecological issues. Uh, feminist political ecology uh, brings to this an emphasis on politics and power at different scales and in different places while highlighting gender power relations. So feminist political ecology um, look at this kind of issue of access um, and use of resources. You know, a geographical reading of this would look at how resources are spatially distributed and unevenly distributed. Um, and feminist political ecology also sees mm -hmm. gender as a social category which mediates um, access and control um, and also makes a commitment to tackling uh, gender inequalities. Um, so this isn't necessarily exactly the way I um, employ feminist political ecology in the approach. I uh, draw on kind of the broader um, body of work within feminist political ecology, which has also looked, for example, at the gendered natures of knowledges. So um, meaning, uh, for example, Kimura looked at the nuclear after the Fukushima disaster in 2011. And looked how concerns over toxicity um, of organic farmers and people involved in farming, and um, how the kind of official discourses reflected a sort of hegemonic uh, masculinity, which emphasized uh, control 
um, and sort of painting the concerns of the local populations as um, irrational, so read sort of feminine concerns. So um, kind of thinking about the kind of gendered nature of knowledge in terms of, um, of, of how that how that's, uh, comes across the difference between local and, and um, official discourses. Um, feminist political ecology also reorientates appreciation of scale to maybe overlooked or invisible scales of the body, emotion and spaces. And um, so thinking about how these different categories and um, how experience of resource control and access are mediated, um, as well as the impacts of um, as well as the impacts of environmental issues. Um, and, and how really emotions are an important part and how experience of resources are mediated uh, and environmental issues are mediated through the body and shape how we uh, connect to place and how we feel about spaces. Um, also kind of thinking in this lower, uh, this, these more micro political scales or the scale of the body and emotions uh, opens up space to think about how uh, we're essential, how um, relational uh, lived experiences are and then opens up space also to think about the more than human. So how people experience their environment, how they relate to and connect with uh, more, than, more than human and um, so species, environment and uh, nature. Um, All together, I think this contributes um, essentially an appreciation and an, uh, and, uh, an analysis of the situated knowledges, as Haraway put it, um, so meaning the kind of on the ground knowledges and um, connection to place um, that sort of disrupt um, the tendency of kind of top down abstract calculations. Um, and then the final thing which um, feminist political ecology helpfully uh, contributes is this understanding of um, the fact that there are many alternatives to the sort of uh, dominant approaches that are now currently being taken um, it, towards environmental issues. So um, that's what that's standing for. So, for example, Meta and Harcourt um, challenge the kind of uh, global uh, definitions of planetary boundaries um, and, and kind of environmental targets and how this can undermine people's sense of place and what people place value on in terms of livelihoods and other ways uh, of living. Um, so bringing all of this um, into account, I what I did in terms of data collection was I did multiple field trips uh, to County Leitrim between 2021 and uh, this year, 2022. So I had lots of informal um, conversations. I think I was there maybe five or six times at this stage, and um, you know, did exploring myself, uh, looking around. You can often, you can actually see and get a sense of the scale of, of forestry in the in the area, um, and then I also did um, I did twelve um, interviews with with community members, so semi structured interviews, just to get a sense of and scope out the impacts as people were experiencing them. And um, so as you'll see, I also kind of in my exploring took quite a lot of photos just to get a sense of how, um, yeah, how the, how the forestry felt. So I'll share those with you as I go through, just so you can also um, get a sense of it for those of you who are coming to the topic new. So I'm just gonna turn now to share some of my um, findings of the set of the ongoing work. So there's kind of three broad findings um, as to the impacts of, um, of, of uh, forestry in these areas, which we can appreciate through feminist political ecology. And what I talk about also um, in the introduction around kind of processes of dispossession that can happen as a result of addressing environmental and uh, conservation questions. So the first um, impact is really around the changing landscapes. So I'll talk about each of these more in detail. The second one is around loss, loss of land. And finally, um, the impacts on the more than uh, human, which have come through in the interviews. So just to begin with the um, first issue of uh, changing landscapes, and here you see an image of um, a landscape that's been um, uh, cl uh, clearfelled uh, from the forestry. Um, there's differing impacts to this, but essentially emerging um, within the interviews is the extent to which um, both the growth and um, felling of, of these forestry plantations are um, changing local landscapes for people. Um, so they're really um, associated with significant uh, impacts. So if you look at the growth, for example, these uh, plantations are grown very densely. They grow very high. Um, this is... Oh, sorry, did someone talk? Uh, did someone ask me a question or just? Okay. Um, so sorry, yeah. So 
quite a few number of um, people talked about how the growth itself of the forestry and um, these plantations impact people. So this was often spoken about, for example, um, as to the trees grow, uh, uh, blocking out light, impacting houses and land. So just um, as I go through all of these findings, I'm um, you know, going to share some uh, quotations from the interviews. So for example, one um, person put it that I see them as oppressive because they are so dark. North Leitrim is one of the wettest, dampest places of Ireland. So if you want to, you want to encourage in as much daylight as possible, but it doesn't happen when you have these trees at that height. Someone else sharing, no, I wouldn't like them because there's nothing living in them. They're just a dark, dreary place, to put it in my own words. So the land beside forestry is also changed. So it's not only impacting, you know, houses and dwellings, but also um, because of the lack of light and, um, you know, areas that were once meadow or fields and um, become mossy because the, the sun never gets on the ground. So one person describing this said, once the land is planted beside it, the land that's quite close to the forestry, the sun never shines, it gets mossy, nothing grows in it. Another participant describing personal experience of this shared. And um, so it's encroached the farm, many of the fields beside it, and it has just turned to mo moss. You don't get any light until the afternoon. So this is um, also associated with feelings of isolation. So due to the, the kind of changing of the, the vistas or the, the areas um, of landscape, so people recounted the feelings of isolation. So no longer being able to see neighbors or the lights of town, nearby towns disappearing as the trees um, grew up. Um, so there's also um, plantations are routinely clear felt. So this significantly transforms uh, local environments as well. So participants also shared this. Um, so really um, this was across uh, the interviews that people talked about the clear felling. And um, so people described it as Armageddon, as a war zone, an awful mess, devastation. And um, capturing this embodied vi visceral impact, one participation, uh, one participant shared um, how you know the impacts of seeing Clearfell are often overlooked in the dominant discourse. But um, quote, the other thing nobody alludes to in the conversation is the physical wrenching that you get when you go along in your car and you see Clearfell for the first time. Your body automatically feels sick. The least thing you can say is it's unsightly and the worst thing it brings you to cursing because you know that's not right. You know the damage is there. So there's also um, a lot of discussion about these kind of abrupt changes in landscape. So, you know, going from kind of thick forestry to it then being completely cha uh, changed and, and clear felt and the sort of feeling of disorientation um, that people people feel with these kind of abrupt changes, but also how the forestry or the plantations being gone remind them of the, the sort of vistas that were lost before, because again, they can see their neighbors, they can see the lights of local villages, the smoke, things like that. So really the impacts of plantations are very much mediated um, through feelings and senses. So the feeling of seeing clear fell, the lack of light and um, a disorientation. Um, and it's, I think it's important um, or, or that feminist political ecology um, helps us to better understand uh, these impacts through um, appreciating the, the level of kind of embodied uh, and emotional um, responses to environmental issues. Um, so the next um, impact um, that has certainly come through uh, in the interviews is really the loss of land that's occurring um, as increasing tracts of Leitrim come under forestry. So uh, this is just an image of the ground, how it looks uh, in a six spruce uh, plantation. Um, so um, what came through in the forestry is that um, really it's being increasingly driven by private and external actors um, because they're drawing down the grants. And um, this is uh, distorting the, the land price in Leitrim and local people just essentially aren't able to com com compete anymore. Um, so in particular, uh, farmers are impacted. So young farmers, meaning you know people new to farming, uh, younger generations who want to come into farming, who are no longer able to, to afford land because, um, because of the increased cost of land as a result of forestry. And um, they're also not able to access credit. So what came through quite a few times is that you know uh, farmers, if they want to borrow land, um, money um, to, to buy land, to expand their far farm or to get into farming new, they, they won't be given credit by the banks, but that the banks very much do back forestry because it has a fixed return on investment. Um, there was a lot of concerns over the socioeconomic impacts of this. Um, and I want it bent for, for kind of rural futures and, and trying to get across the impacts of, um, of the loss of, of land to farming and the loss of land for local people. 
So as one person shared, it's a huge success in any community to see a farmer, young or old, be able to succeed in purchasing any bit of ground. The dominance of industrial forestry, forestry is taking land out of agriculture and it's putting it to industrial footing that can never be reversed. So what they mean by never be reversed is that once land comes under forestry, you know, that could be 50, 60 years while the trees are growing. Um, and you only get a license to fell the trees on the basis that you replant the trees. So, you know, you're thinking of at least two cycles, if not three. So it's going over, you know, 80 plus years that land once it comes under forestry. And there's also the, the impacts on soil in terms of soil depletion um, from obviously planting a crop uh, that's harvested multiple times on land that's already um, perhaps not having so many nutrients. Um, so speaking of these uh, impacts, one person shared, what a lot of people don't realize with small farmers, anytime a small farm closes, the co-op is hit, the market is hit, the supermarket is hit. The small farmer, he spends his money locally. And when you take him out of the equation, little by little, um, um, he talks, and then he just keeps on talking about the impacts. Whilst another uh, interviewee talks about all the money that's coming into Leitrim, where is it? It's missing from the county. And when people come in and plant it, they don't live here. Even if they lived here, it would be different practice. The money isn't circulating in the same way. When the land goes into permanent forestry and it is permanent, it no longer feeds the local economy. It feeds some other economy in a different economy, but our uh, economy is at a loss in that. So really what people speak about is this, uh, this process of consolidation where uh, smaller farmers are, are being locked out of purchasing, farming, uh, purchasing land for farming as our local people. Um, but they also kind of uh, disrupted claims that um, that forestry was a win for farmers and talked about how actually uh, forestry is, tends towards larger scales just because of the econ economics of it and how um, more and more land is coming under forestry and those involved in forestry are seeking to um, plant more and more land. Um, so this is to do with the cost of machinery and the sort of language that people talked about when talking about this were, for example, they are financial chips and you're in a casino. The analogy is very similar. Whoever is going to win big is whoever is going to bet big. And it's not the farmer who is planting three acres in the corner of a field here and there. Um, which very similar language to the casino. Um, someone else talked about also how it's, it's, um, it's a basically a, a kind of board game to them. Um, they buy here and they buy there and they're trading between each other. Will you swap up that bit for that bit? It's like a board game to them. So um, now I'd like to turn, um, having shared those findings, to um, uh, also the impacts for the, the more than human that came through in the, as a kind of final finding. Um, so really, as people spoke about the impacts of forestry, what really came through and often how they articulated it was um, concern for the impacts of forestry for the more than human. So they really, um, because of the lack of intensive farming and, and the, also, I suppose, the low population density of, of Leitrim, um, there's a lot of rare species, you know, who would have existed on marginal land that's been left behind and uh, very rare habitats. And really, people spoke as if understanding that, that they are uh, custodians um, and, and that these um, that this more than human elements are being impacted. Um, so as one participant put it, it's an absolutely beautiful area. It's worth fighting for. It's worth fighting for Leitrim because it's so unique in its special area of conservation. Everywhere around Leitrim, every acre is a special acre of conservation because it's diverse land and uh, flora and fauna. You know it's just unique. So there was concerns about um, the monoculture, um, so the amount of land and space that was kind of being, and, and species that were being kind of subsumed into this. Um, we are losing our biodiversity by having a dominant strain, strain of crop in the area, um, as one person put it. Others kind of juxtaposed um, the practices of planting and clear felling with the biodiversity crisis that, uh, you know, the, that's within official discourses. So as one person put it, the government and the EU are talking about biodiversity crisis. A few years ago, we had curlews right across the country, but the forestry has been detrimental to their su survival. Um, the foresters will tell you about life that's in these big plantations. Well, I can tell you what's in there. There's deer, fox, badger, and pine marten. And when the, the four of them want to eat, they have to leave. Nothing, no feeding in there. And um, people also spoke about the kind of acid acidification of, of water and how it came up in quite a few interviews about how the older people would talk about how you know the rivers in Leitrim used to be full of fish and how that's um, completely changed. And, and many see that the forestry played a, a really big role in that. 
Um, there was also concern about, you know, where, where were animals going to go, animals that could ex exist in the forest um, after it being clear felled. So one um, participant talked about how there was many animals seen in a local village after clear felling, whilst another in another area of the country talked that, about how they were absolutely delighted to see their resident red squirrel, who they obviously had a connection with after clear felling had taken place of the forest that they had lived in. Um, so um, uh, having shared all of those findings, I just uh, would like to turn now to talk a bit about the, to share some analysis about the impacts um, the impacts of, of, of farming, uh, of forestry. So um, there's kind of three ways I'm looking at this. Uh, first is dispossession and depopulation. So returning to what's been talked about as I did in the review at the very start. Also kind of differing knowledges um, and how this can be seen in the impacts and, and maybe what's valued and what's pri um, privileged in uh, policymaking. And then finally, uh, the, there are many alternatives. So looking at the resistance and, and, and what came through in the interviews about different ways of responding to uh, environmental um, and biodiversity crises. So the first, um, so dispossession and, and depopulation. So really what came through very strongly in the interviews is that forestry is seen as intersecting with and also now as a driver of depopulation uh, in Leitrim. So people talked about how initially in the early days when it was uh, Quilcha uh, buying forestry, there was um, you know, maybe a chance and there was uh, jobs created in the local area about, but, but about how this has very much changed, uh, particularly with privatization and increasingly external pe uh, companies coming in and, and driving forestry. Um, so as one person put it, they planted the land, they socially, socially isolated the people that were there and they left with no other reason than to sell their land, sell their land to forestry because it was devalued. So people really talk about um, and articulated in the sense that they understand that the trees are replacing people. So as one interview put it, I remember my grandfather talking about forestry. It was just lost people. To us, forestry was just about the loss of people. Another said, I'm sure, I suppose I'm aware of it from a young enough age. Uh, my own father has seen a lot of land being planted and a lot of farms being sold off of forestry. And I've seen it come down then throughout the years. Um, so people really, this really came through as strongly um, and people naming specific places that they felt had been um, decimated by forestry that previously used, used to be vibrant, but that um, increasingly um, forestry due to the isolation and the other impacts um, that I talked about earlier on in the findings uh, drove people out of the area. So um, I think it's also important to um, highlight that, you know, this, this kind of intersects with what I said about at the start with uh, longer term historical processes of um, uh, that were contributing to depopulation in places like Leitrim to people having to emig emigrate from the area. And really what came through was people being concerned that there's a, an, an aging population in Leitrim, particularly of farmers, and um, that as people um, maybe move into homes or, or pass on that um, land is increasingly, their land is increasingly being channeled into forestry um, and sometimes maybe not even coming on the market for local people to have a chance, but it's just being directly uh, funneled into forestry. Um, so, um, so people kind of expressed concern, for example, of, you know, what's going to, as one person put it, what's going to happen in years to come? The worry is that years to come, a lot of the rural population here in North Leitrim, they are pension age. A lot of these farmers, like people I know, what's going to happen? Um, so what's going to happen to thousands of acres of land that there won't be a farmer to buy? It's a worry. Um, so really, in terms of this dispossession, it's it's not only land, but it's it's also the soil and the economic dispossession, like I talked about, of this uh, the land uh, money no longer circulating in the economy, and also in terms of rights to participation and environmental justice, where uh, there's been a lot of changes that really have made it difficult for for local people, uh, for the councils to have a say in the the level of afforestation that's going on in Leitrim. So one person uh, talked about it. So this is an area that has been sacrificed. I think they don't think we have a right to be here. The people maybe were only here for 1500 years or something like that. And there was only trees here at one point, but sure the whole country was covered in trees. Um, so very much related to this and, and moving on to the next element is um, the differing knowledges that come out in these contestations around forestry and Leitrim. So, and um, really what I think you can see happening in the case of forestry is that there's um, 
these sort of uh, abstract calculations and targets that are being set around how many how many you know hundreds of uh, hectares of land is to be put under forestry as a way to deal with the biodiversity and climate crisis um, and sort of top down policy making um, that's really come into coming into contestation over um, with place based knowledges so like I talked about about um, people understanding themselves as custodians and, and being aware of and seeing and caring for um, the different species that are living in vitro. Um, so, um, you know, people talk about, um, you know, hen harriers and other species that they feel are, are being directly impacted by the forestry because they're not being seen and not being appreciated. As one person put it, it's a machine that's so old, it's not sensitive enough to the ecology. It doesn't have the right approach to the ecology or the right approach to communities. And um, so also um, there's really this connection to place and different meanings and different values that come um, out and <clears throat> looking at the impacts of forestry. So as one person put it, I have a piece of land up there. I wouldn't like to see it being planted because it would change the face of the landscape there. It's a rugged landscape running up the side of a mountain and it would break my heart to see it planted. So just different appreciations of place, uh, different connections to place, as well as um, different temporalities. Um, so, uh, People talked a lot about how, you know, understanding how long land will be under forestry once it goes under forestry and really wishing for longer term um, thinking or visionary thinking when it, when it comes to thinking about what's going to happen to land in the area. And the worry that unless these issues are addressed now, they're, they're literally going to take another 30, 40 years and then they're going to have to be addressed again because, because of the way um, the cycles of the forestry works. Um, so someone said, there are long term issues when you plant those trees, it's 80 years. So unless the, the planning of governments is for five year cycles and it doesn't lend itself to planning communities or addressing the issues that we have now. The issues we have now would take 50 or 60 years to address if they're not addressed now. Um, and they'll continue to plant if they, if they don't ever address them and they'll shut down whole areas of the county. So um, the final thing I want to share um, also in terms of this kind of discussion or analysis is what comes through, I think really strongly is also the idea that there are um, an evidence that there are many alternatives. So, you know, we're all very concerned about uh, environmental issues, about social issues, about how do we address them? And I think what comes through um, in, in with uh, talking with communities in Leitrim is that there are so many alternatives already existing and, and very much being um, vocalized and realized by, by communities. So the first thing to say um, about Leitrim is that there's um, what they're doing is very much uh, they're resisting many uh, extractivist projects. So in Leitrim, um, there was the Love Leitrim campaign, which uh, fought for six years against uh, fracking, which is a very polluting form of extracting uh, fossil fuels and actually led to a, one of the first bans, national wide bans. And um, so we have the communities in Leitrim to thank that we're not having fracking in Ireland with all its environmental and, and public health impacts. And um, there's also Save Leitrim who are highlighting the issues of the forestry plantations. There's Treasure Leitrim who are resisting and um, planned uh, gold mining projects. And there's Save Do a Mountain who are trying to highlight the impacts of industrial wind turbine projects, um, both in terms of biodiversity and what I similar to what I was talking about earlier about minding and taking care of um, the different species there, as well as impacts for community. So they're very much highlighting the impacts of, of kind of dominant approaches to, to doing um, sustainability. Um, and these resistances, you know, it's not only about, it's not really about being against something, but it's actually incredibly visionary. So kind of talking about the sort of dominant media or policy discourses uh, around these resistances and in the case of forestry, as one person put it, the easiest way to knock this as a group is, oh, them bunch of dot, dot, dot. They're against everything. We are for everything. We want the survival of, you know, the wildlife, our communities, our environment. We don't want to see any more devastation done and we don't want to replicate it, what's happening in Leitrim right now across the country. So the kind of end of this uh, quote brings me into the other really, I think, uh, beautiful element of the resistances that are going on in Leitrim is just the solidarity and care um, that comes through. So really, um, Northern Leitrim has a longer history of um, forestry, as I said, and they wanted to alert communities in the south of the county um, as to the impacts forestry would have. So you have these kind of lines of solidarity across the county, but also helping uh, other counties now who are also facing forestry. 
Um, there's also really clear conceptions of spatial justice. So the idea that they understand that Leitrim is being disproportionately impacted. They understand that the government has targets, but the way that that could be done in a much more spatially just way. So as one person put it, and this came through quite a lot, if you have a policy where you want 18% of the county country planted and you want to meet climate and biodiversity, then you just have to say to, simply to people who own land that they should plant land. I encourage them to plant 18% of their own land until you, until you meet the target. And don't do that in a, with a sledgehammer, do it in a fair way. So there's also intergenerational justice, which comes through, um, as I talked about a bit earlier, thinking in these kind of longer term temporalities. Um, and also, as one person put it, they aren't really thinking of planting woodlands for just to be there for the environment, just for people in 100 years to go, well, isn't this lovely? It's all for profit. Everything is really for profit. You can't say it's for the environment when you just kind of rip it down after a few years. So really this idea of thinking about, for example, even the case of a forest, that we should plant something now that will exist for uh, a generation that's going to live in 100 years time. And I think altogether, really broadly, what this shows um, what's going on in Leitrim in terms of the visionary resistances and um, in terms of the solidarity and care, care for, for one another, um, but also care for the more than human and the, the notions of spatial and intergenerational justice um, are many of the different uh, components that we need to think about more place-based uh, regenerative futures. So meaning shifting from uh, the extractivist model that we have now, which you know seeks to make profit from, from, from nature, uh, from people, and thinking about how you rather um, might regenerate nature, might regenerate communities, and do that in a, in a place-based, sensitive, and caring way. So um, with that in mind, I just want to uh, flag one more thing, and that's that in case uh, you're interested in forestry or uh, you want to look into it more in detail or have um, some form of input, uh, for what it's worth, there's actually a forestry consultation going on at the moment, and there's a deadline next Thursday on the 29th of November, um, and groups um, have been kind of highlighting uh, highlighting the, the strategy, the draft strategy plan on forestry. Um, and issues with it and, and um, things that should be input into the consultation. Um, and I think Uplift also have an open letter uh, linked to it at the moment. So just in case you want to take a look at that. So um, other than that, thank you very much for listening. And yeah, I look forward to a discussion. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Louise. That was, that was fantastic. That was a really good um, uh, overview of all those things. And, and great to hear about, the, for, for me personally, to hear some more detail about um, what you've been, been doing. I have some questions, but I want to leave it open to the floor. So if anyone has a question, as I say, if you want to, to ask it, turn on your microphone at least, you can do so. But if that's not possible, you can also put it into the chat and, and uh, I can pass it on to Louise. Maybe in the, in the, whilst we wait for that, like one of the things, and I know that you know, we've talked about this in other, other settings before, but it comes out really strongly here is the, so it was interesting at the start you were saying about the, a lot of the discourse around green grabbing and and um, the kind of yeah the kind of political economy of kind of extractivist forestry, let's say, has been focused on the global south for the last kind of a couple of decades. Um, and now that you're kind of work, and I'm sure there's there's maybe others in in other contexts in Europe or or elsewhere who are kind of looking to the global north as kind of a gap of the similar dynamics that are at play in, in the global north. And I think that's really. Um, inter interesting course and one of the things that stands out about Ireland in this case is that it's a kind of post-colonial context um, and it seems like there's some of this discussion of the kind of different temporalities and the histories not just this kind of looking to the future and intergenerational justice but also maybe in a kind of against a backdrop of intergenerational injustice around the histories of colonization and I'm kind of wondering does that get evoked um, in your conversations with the, 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 the people you talk to in Leitrim is that a, is that a dynamic of or a factor that they're thinking of, of, you know, in some sense, it could be quite trite to be like, and this is just the same as the Brits were doing, you know, a hundred years ago, but is, is there, a, is that something that's animating in, in their way of thinking about their relationship to the land and these processes? Um, I don't think they're, they're not articulating it that way, but I think what they're speaking to um, certainly does overlap. So that's um, what I was trying to tease out a bit, uh, you know, with regards to um, kind of, um, and emigration out and the kind of old, older um, mm. population and how, um, um, you know, there's like a legacy there as to why that's come to be. And now forestry sort of intersecting with it. So even mm. um, one thing that came through, for example, in, in more concrete cases, the 
um, the village of Kilty Clogher, which is right on the border, um, and people talking about how, um, so there was a second uh, school there that got bombed, um, and then people left the area. Their roads also got bombed, so that really affected them. But oh. people sort of talk about it as about how, like, it was this was sort of the death nail because people left and then forestry came in and it sort of got a strong enough right. hold that it tipped it to the to the, to the point that um, forest became the driver of the depopulation. So right. it, it it kind of takes shape in in those different ways and and sort of talking about um like I said about these differing knowledges, like what's prioritized, this quite centralized. Uh, evaluation that's kind of you know top down imposed on a community, um, as well as um, as well as kind of talking about people returning to the area or um, new people coming to the area, but being um, finding it difficult to get planning permission for a house, for example, or to hmm. settle in the local area. Uh, but um, that forestry isn't really subject to the same uh, restrictions, let's say, in terms of its uh-huh. impact. So so like it's it they don't for, they don't make the connection as directly as you said it but certainly that's what they're they're talking to these legacies and um how these are being uh let's say deepened you know by by forestry and how mm. it's being implemented yeah right. and one for the question for a uh, let's see if anyone else is is a uh, just about the kind of the the feminist political ecology approach with kind of drawing things to the fore that can often be ignored or seem to be irrelevant or dismissed as irrational or, or, or so on you know aspects of kind of an emotional attachment to to um place but also to kind of more than human um habitats and so on and the kind of embodied nature of, of uh, our relationship to place so i mean it, it seems almost that like from what you're doing it's not just a kind of feminist political culture there's almost like a feminist approach to the conception of place or like placed relations or something that's at work here um that's not really a question, but uh, does that a, a concept or what, what do you? Is that something, um, is that something e- that you're... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that comes true in this kind of uh, so sort of what I was saying, like when you bring it to the scale of the body or um, emotions, it's like um, which you know feminist political ecology, uh, ecologists do work on, and um, it's like this appreciation of the sort of emergent nature of being and how it's like, inter- you know, we're not just like rational individual entities, but that we're connected to others, like in our community, we're connected to place, we're connected to the more than human um, and appreciating that that's actually the way that we are existing in the world. Mm-hmm. And so when you have this different conception of what it is to be human, I think that opens up sp- space to think in a different way about place-based connections whether it be mm. to local communities like local landscapes environments um, but also you know the other communities the more than human communities that live there right I, mean, I thought this this discussion of, of light was like really fascinating about like the, like the the making dark you know of the, yeah of, of yeah the and place. you can see it you can see it like uh i didn't have any sort of aerial but you like you can see both nearby but also the color of the landscape changes. People talk about that. It gets dark because the sea spruce is like it's a dark, it's a dark tree. You know, it's a conifer. Right. Great. Anyone want to to ask uh, questions from our from our audience? Hi, John. Uh, hi there. Hi, Louise. Uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, for that superb presentation. Um, so I'm John Morrissey from uh, Mary Macleod College in Limerick, uh, and Louise, I, I guess. First question I have is the the sort of um, the issue around uh, kind of knowledge mismatch, if you like, or the mismatch in expertise. Uh, you know, you mentioned the kind of top down technical assessments that are there, and and the also I think importantly the sort of undervaluation of local knowledge. Um, so I, I guess I, what I'm thinking of is if if you if you look at maybe some of the rationales forwarded for these projects, the kind of greenwashing thing uh, of you know, environmental benefit and so on. On the one hand, you would say that perhaps a sort of, you know, rigorous development of metrics and and so on is one way to to counter that. Uh, But you also mentioned that the planetary boundaries um, ideas, uh, you know, are somewhat alienating at the the local level and so on. So I I guess that my my question is kind of just a general one on, uh, I suppose, the the issue of maybe the lack of the expertise uh, from the local community to to kind of counter maybe some of the top-down um, approaches and rationales, um, and then I suppose the the, the problem of building capacity uh, at the local level, um, 
and engagement with, with stuff like, you know, the planetary boundaries are, are important, but obviously um, if they're not engaging with people, they're of limited value. Mm. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Sean. Um, yeah, so like my sense is that actually, uh, I'm not sure how much, I mean, at least the people I've been talking with and exchanging with, like they have uh, huge capacities and huge local knowledges of place and you know they do their own like citizen science and they they know what's living there they know what's bog you know so they talk about like places will, are still being planted apparently that are you know peatlands and they've gone out and seen the turf being cut and then the areas are replanted so like it's sort of this just like bearing witness and knowing from living there and maybe also having living there or having connections to the place going back a long time where for example People talk about, like I said, the fish in the rivers and older people saying you just used to step into the river and put out your hand and you'd pick up a fish. And like, so no, no way. So it's like, you know, when we think about these shifting baselines, like they have a sense of what the baseline is and what's existing there now also and what's being lost, you know, both historically and, and currently. So my, I think my sense is like the knowledges are there. They're just not being, uh, they're just not being appreciated. And the channels to participation that do exist are getting increasingly uh, exclusionary. So a lot of people talked about how, you know, to put in an appeal against forestry costs, they introduced a fee. So it costs like 200 euro now. And, you know, that appeal might be amended and then go back to the, or it might go back to the forester, be amended and then go back into the system. So you could have, you, could, you know, you could end up paying 200 euro three times on the same uh, license. So like you don't get the money back. And that, you know, also there's not just one license, you know, there's multiple sites. So it just gets very costly. And um, so like even the channels to put in that, you know, to, to report back, it's it's very difficult. Um, and it's also not forestry, as far as I understand it, it's like um, it's an exempted development. So it's not subject to the same overall uh, higher higher level environmental impact assessments. And um, so there's like not much. The, the knowledge is are there. The channels just aren't really there where they're becoming increasingly limited to actually share those knowledges and also i think broadly the people of leitrim are sort of just being dismissed and that's what i was saying about how someone talked about how they're just like considered a bunch of whatevers but actually that they're 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 not just giving out or they're not against forestry but they're for forestry they're for local communities in a way that's like place-based and appropriate and you know so yeah, I hope that answers your question, but that's just to kind of sketch out a bit of the sense of, um, yeah, so it's like if you don't appreciate the local knowledges uh, and you have these hierarchy targets and you have them based on limits and based on scarcity and based on, you know, we have to address the urgent climate and environmental biodiversity crisis. Um, yeah, there's just a risk that that can really lead to significant uh, injustices on the ground if you're not listening to the frontline communities who are saying what the impacts are. Superb, thank you. Thanks, John. It's, it's nice, to, nice to see you, John. Uh, uh, Louise has, has talked about you. I don't know if you're aware that there's a, a geographer called John Morrissey. So I, you're, I, I, I am aware uh, of the, <laughs> the confusion that happens with John Morrissey. No, no, Limerick, John Moore. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> nice to meet you. Sophia, did you have a question that you wanted to, to ask? Yeah, I, I just briefly, I just wanted to say thanks, Louise. I really enjoyed your presentation. I thought it was very powerful. <laughs> and um, Actually, when I was talking uh, or when I was listening to you talk about the, that embodied connection with the land, it reminded me of a book that I read a while ago by Richard Powers, The Overstory, mm. Mm. which is one, which is an amazing book. It's so unique. It, do, it does that. It makes that connection. And um, it just shows how how, you know, the, the land and nature and our connection with it reaches into every part of our lives and who we are as people. Um, and I, I find you know your, your your comments on the depopulation of rural areas really really resonated with me I was in North Mayo recently on a trip and um I was down around Ballycastle in Kalala I don't know if you've ever been there and it's it, it's a place like Ballycastle is a town that used to have something like 12 or 16 pubs and now there's one and I, I don't mean to you know talk about pubs or anything but it's just a reflection of the depopulation in the area and when you talk about that you know that knowledge of shifting baselines obviously if young people are moving out of the area eventually that knowledge gets lost with them moving away so I, I was just really wondering you know you talked at the end about ways um to regenerate the land you know there needs to be more talk about that and more done about it what what do you see the role of um you know 
various groups, whether it's the EPA or local government, if it exists, or, you know, the national government and even the EU, which have a hand in all of this, uh, what, what, what do you think that they could do differently so that this is sort of all mitigated or improved on? Yeah, no, thank you so much for your comments. Yeah, it's a great book and I yeah, really appreciate all the different things you drew together there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose, um, the, it, again, similar to what I said to John, it's about like listening to local people who actually are the experts, you know, of their local area and what's existing there and um, allowing them more control or participation in what happens in their local area, you know, and um, one thing that came up in the interviews, you know, when they were talking about how, you know, quite a lot of land like is still owned uh, by by state bodies or, um, you know, there's there's state organizations or agencies who are, you know, maybe responsible for the water and um, having land. And, and uh, it came up in one interview how they spoke about like they have they have the keys to the land like they could they could actually play a much bigger role in, in solving the problem. But, um, you know, I was talking to my colleague, uh, Pash Bresnahan, about this the other day as well. I think I think we maybe have to start thinking uh, a bit more about, yeah, who, who who owns the land and who we're allowing to increasingly buy the land, because it will make it more and more difficult. It, to, speaking to the case of forestry, where people talk about how they don't even like these private actors, they talk about quilcha, it's OK, you know, it's, it's um, I mean, not fully OK because of what's happening, but, you know, it's it's better because they they're. They, they're, it's public land, they can see what's going on, they can go in there and find ring forts or species and they can report that back and they have kind of a go-to or a port of call. Whereas um, whereas with external forestry, it's often under a trust. They don't know who's involved. They can't even find people to call contact about putting hedges. Like it's just this kind of nameless, faceless entity. And more and more land is coming onto these nameless, faceless entities. And they're not just not local to Leitrim. They're not local, they're, they're you know, pension funds from Canada or America or you know who are buying a plant and this is happening and it's happening at a like accelerated rate so the ingredients i think are all there to do this in a different way um and this offers like it gives me a lot of hope like and even just interacting with communities in Leitrim that are involved in so many different things uh but that needs to be like cherished and platformed and resourced um, and and there is a risk that this increasing uh, stretch of you know financial frontiers into places like Leitrim will it, it's just going to undermine that so it's like to to value and, and recognize the local knowledges that are there the care that is there within communities and um, listen to what they're saying because they're experts in how we can address this and, and that the, st the state could play a role in that um, yeah thanks thanks Amelia. So I do see we're we're over time um, so I mean, if anyone has to go, of course, please, please uh, feel free to, but maybe we stay for a few more minutes if you're happy, Louise. Yeah, that's fine. No worries. Um, is there other questions, Tommy? Did, did you have a, a question? I see it just popped up. <laughs> you were just making yourself seen. Um, yeah, th some of those uh, questions there, I mean, that, that question about, you know, ownership in relation to basically a, accountability, you know, it's when there's no uh, purchase through the state or other public bodies on, you know, who owns land and, and what they do with it and what interests it serves. Um, I mean, it's really frustrating in these discussions, you know, internationally, but also in Ireland, that it's kind of con continuously put into this binary of there's the economy versus the, the environment. Um, and I know we're in some sense talking about economic values versus other forms of value that, the, that local people have an attachment to their land and ecosystems and the relations that make it up. But there's, it's also a question of like, well, which economy is it? You know, this is a this is a new economy of you know financialization of natural resources and land and 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 even the soil in a sense you know as you said you know it's like depleting there was something really stark you, one of the quotes from your um, interviewees that this, this is forever is that it? like this this trade this forest is now forever that's like it's gone it's not even yeah. on a on a like a human lifetime scale you know um, yeah 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 no that comes through a lot like uh because it, it, it's one aspect like i said it's the regulation of it so like it has to go under forestry again once it's on the forestry it's so so one element is like the the regulation that has to be replanted but the other element is like the depletion of the soil and the nutrients and and that this is getting removed from from the place and yeah like the the, the people i talked to they have a really um a sense of this like being a different economy it's not a local economy it's like wealth being sucked out by these exactly like you say this new uh frontier 
um, of financialization and, and you know trying to see forests as investments. Um, so so yeah, I th I think it uh, it's very complex, and I'm still trying to unpack it myself. But there's definitely uh, it needs to be an understanding that like there's differing economies here, and they have differing impacts for for local communities and for the future of areas like Leitrim. And Iris, uh, the, the head of the department, had to head off another meeting. Said that thank you a lot. It was really interesting insights, um, and she would be really interested if you'd want to papers to recommend uh, in relation to the attachment to land literature. Uh, okay. Covered lots of land at the coast. Uh, she works on on coastal dynamics, and particularly you know with climate mm. change and, and coastal erosion and and so on. Mm. Um, it's it's interesting that the emotional dimension or that kind of affect dimension that we are starting to see. Like including within Ireland, including some of the work that Anna Davis has been doing about a kind of a, a more serious, um, certainly in the schools, I hear my what my middlings are, are doing at school and primary school, um, about discussions of like climate anxiety and this being recognized as okay, this is a real thing, which is having real effects on you know, just the not just the mental health and, and well-being of, of people of, of different ages, particularly young people, but also in their there's a, a fear in the government of like, well, people won't be be able to be mobilized in order to enact government thing, uh, governance measures to, to mitigate climate and so on. But it's, it, it, it makes me think of this kind of a totally other scale. Again, that's still kind of part of the climate anxiety is it's, it's too big to deal with. It's this macro scale and you, you feel in, incapable and mix anxiety and so on. But then there's also this other experiences of loss and anxiety and I don't know, a kind of land depression perhaps of like, you know, this loss of land, a grieving mm. for spaces that actually are a lot more tangible in a sense um it's a whole other set of emotions that that are there um, yeah um i suppose two things that come up for me uh just responding to that is one i can't remember who said it but it was this idea that like thinking of scale like you're saying that one way that we have to address uh where we can address ourselves the climate crisis and you know all these things that seem kind of huge is just to you know, find a piece of land, have a, as in a place or, you know, have a connected to it and take care of it, you know, and, um, you know, I know there's, you know, growing exactly like you say, climate anxiety and also fear about like that we're not doing enough or how can we make the change? And that's why I, you know, wanted to end with the idea of that there are many alternatives and mm. this, this idea essentially that, um, um, or the fact that, that you know, the, the solutions are already here uh, we're just, uh, they're just maybe made invisible or they're smaller scale and they're in communities um, and they're being challenged or undermined by, by other ways of approaching the sustainability transition. But really, um, like I said already, like it gives me a lot of hope to see that there are communities like uh, already taking action and, and, and that idea that they're, it's a resistance, but it's not against something, it's for oh. something. And they have this vision and they they're they have this appreciation and this this um yeah, way of connecting to the land, way of connecting to nature, taking care of nature, taking care of one another. That's like everything what we actually need and we need more of. And um, so just to, to reflect on that and to to take yes, solace in the fact that that's existing and to you know platform those stories more and appreciate those stories more um, as we orientate ourselves in dealing with the so Yimbyism, yeah. yes, in my backyard. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, John, did you want to, to, to comment there? Sorry, can I just jump back in there again? Sorry, I, I don't know if I'm uh, being very uncouth, taking a, a second oh, round. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned scale there, and I do think, Louise, that um, there's a very, very strong scalar theme comes true in all your findings there. Um, you did mention it in your, one of your final slides, kind of the temporal dimension. Uh, and I guess the question is, to, to what extent do you want to kind of push the, the scalar um, story as well because it, it does come through very strongly in in the, the findings I think um, I suppose thinking about scale uh, you know on one hand you might you, you might well be a, a legitimate project in terms of carbon sequestration for example that you would heavily forest a, a particular area um, you know in, in your case in Leitrim there, there are big question marks over the legitimacy of some of those claims but it, even if it is a case that you know that's a legitimate way of absorbing on carbon um, the scalar question is an interesting one to look at because at the local level, it still might not be the right solution or it might not be the right thing to do. Um, so I think scale and justice are kind of two themes that interact 
strongly and 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 are, you know they're all there in your in your analysis as was the question is to what extent do you want to kind of push those as as key findings um and you know language like green sacrifice zones is probably very emotive and powerful but whether that's useful to describe what's happening mm. in Leitrim in those terms or not I'm not too sure yeah no that's really helpful and that actually reminded me that it's scale and it's also this like spatial element of uh like I said there's kind of uneven implementation of forestry but exactly like you say um at a local level like it might not be the right thing and, and that's uh, the broader question is like if it's like first the if we do forestry versus the the how and right now it's the question of like how it's going to be done it's going to be done anyway uh, and and one thing that comes through is that um, already so much of Leitrim is under forestry so it's this recognition that even if it was a different model of forestry that would still be a whole lot of land uh, like so even if it was native forestry or you know forestry for longer term uh, thinking about the impacts and and I think this the notion of scale and the notion of spatial that's really missing in the approach right now to appreciate what's already in an area and whether they need more or not um so yeah that's really helpful maybe i should tease uh tease that out more as you say um i think we're, we're 10 minutes over so i think we should probably wind it up but um thanks so much uh to, to louise for a fantastic fascinating uh talk and discussion and uh also to, to those of you who came and uh, engaged um i'm going to stop the recording find where that is. Stop recording.